Hello and welcome to Talking It History, the podcast where we, Matt and Max, talk about works of alternate history, alternate history scenarios, and history in general. This episode, we watched a film. And what a film. Oh, what a film. What a film. The film Mission to Moscow. Woof. <laughs> we, we actually just posted the Gabriel over the White House episode. And, and during that episode, we mentioned, man, maybe we should check out Mission to Moscow, because that's another completely insane film starring the great Walter Houston. Yes, Walter Houston. He's back again <laughs> and better than ever. <laughs> What a great one-two punch of insanity, these two <laughs> movies. <laughs> Holy crap. They are insane in their own ways, but this one, Holy. Mission to Moscow takes the cake, as crazy <laughs> as that may sound. Yeah, because, I mean, don't get me wrong, Gabriel of the White House is nuts, but this <laughs> is on a completely different level. I oh mean, this God. is this is like alternate history. It is, yeah. This is a this comes from an alternate universe. This has been transmitted to us from a different world. Yes, truly. And, and to kind of like understand what we're talking about mission to moscow is a propaganda film it's made by the united states warner uh, brothers, warner brothers the patriotic warner brothers as they talk about at the beginning <laughs> they they specifically call out the warner brothers the two guys the enomaniacs <laughs> <laughs> but where's uh where's dot I in all know. this i don't know but but yeah so this is a movie about a guy named joseph e davies he was the second ambassador to the Soviet Union after William Bullet, um, Bullet Bill. You may remember him from the Super Mario Brothers games. Um, nice. Yes, um, <laughs> but but he's number two. He was a lawyer. A he lawyer. was a lawyer, been the head of the Federal Trade Commission under Woodrow Wilson. Who, Woodrow. who? Ha- <laughs> I mean, I don't know if there's like a, a nicer way to say this, but who the filmmakers appear to have a hard on for. They really like him a lot. There's a part where they're in the League of Nations and they lovingly zoom in on a bust of Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> the icon of Woodrow Wilson to be held above all of us. There's a signed picture of Woodrow Wilson on FDR's desk at one point. Yeah, it's like to Franklin, the only man I ever loved or whatever, you know. Um <laughs> <laughs> but and even in the intro, the very beginning of this movie is nuts because it's the man himself, Joseph Davies, and he's speaking directly to the camera. Real Joseph Davies. The real man himself. So there was a book called Mission to Moscow about Joseph's time in the Soviet Union as an ambassador. And it was really popular. It sold a lot of copies and they made a movie out of it. And this guy had complete editorial control over every word stated in this movie. Which which we'll get to later. <laughs> <laughs> but he chose to start this film speaking directly into the camera. And during this thing, he introduces himself and he says he was one of Woodrow Wilson's young men. And he doesn't explain what that means. He just says it's he's one of his young men who went to Europe with him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> And he becomes one of Joseph Stalin's young men later in this film. <laughs> but but he kind of lays it all out. And he, he straight up says there is no country that has been more prejudiced against and misrepresented. Yes. No than, country more committed to peace. To peace. To world peace <laughs> than the Soviet Union. And honesty. Their leaders are more honest <laughs> than... So honest. <laughs> They tell nothing but the truth all the time. <laughs> and, and this is a theme we'll touch on multiple times through this, but <sighs> Joseph Davies, like, we can't figure out, was he, like, a total dupe? Was he, like, a communist sympathizer? Or, like, what? how could this man who had a very distinguished career beforehand and showed no real sympathy for leftist causes beforehand be so fully taken in? I mean, he talks about, I'm a lawyer. I'm friends with a lot of rich people. I'm a capitalist. And I'm religious. He he stresses the fact that he's a Christian many times. In His the mother was some sort of famous evangelist, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the first shots of the movie is <laughs> when we meet Walter Houston. <laughs> because what happens is, is that Joseph Davies does his part, and then Walter Houston as Joseph Davies starts talking to the camera in a breaking of the fourth wall. Same room, same <laughs> desk. <laughs> they might as well just shook hands and say, thank you, I'll take over from here. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, now I am Joseph Davies. 
And then he starts addressing the camera, and then it goes into the actual movie. Yeah, it's so bizarre. There's two intros of breaking the fourth wall. So weird. But on his desk, he's got the Bible quote from, uh, I think it's Isaiah, about they shall beat their uh, swords into plowshares. Yeah. They beat your swords into plowshares. No, but so this movie is... Again, it has the acting of a 1940s movie, so it's like very exaggerated. Oh People do not talk like this in real life. <sighs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty bad in a lot of places. I don't know if Walter Houston is. I don't know if he's a bad actor, or I, I don't know, or everyone's Oscar. a bad actor. Like he won I, an I Oscar. He did for Treasure yeah. of the Sierra Madre, best supporting actor. Uh, his son. Well, he was definitely directing. gets best supporting actor for the Soviet Union in this movie. <laughs> He supports the hell out of the Soviet Union. He screams into the camera about how great the Soviet Union is at the end of this movie. Yeah, really. I mean, literal he's screaming. Just, he's like, his hair's all screwed up, and he's like pointing at people in the audience who are heckling him. He's off script. Just like, oh, you want to talk about Finland, huh? I'll tell you all about Finland. Mannerheim, Hitler's buddy. You shut the hell up. I, you... Basically about to fight people in the audience. <laughs> well, the people who are also in the audience screaming at him with wild eyes. Everyone That's... is screaming with wild eyes. and Yeah, if you don't like the Soviet Union, you're either a fascist with a monocle, or you're crazy, or you're one of those Japanese guys. You damn <laughs> Japanese so-and-sos. Uh. Well, and to skip ahead, whenever the, the evil Japanese show up, movie they play this you hear like a gong yeah the racist asian stereotypical music it is it the audience the yellow peril is upon us you know this movie knows its audience people in the united states did not like japan very much in 1943 because that's when this movie came out. That's very important to remember. 1943. So the war the is... The heart of the war. This yes. is the... You know, we're dead center of the war. Post-Stalingrad, but there's still so much left to do before D-Day. And basically, the point of this film... In fact, I think the whole reason it was made... I think FDR called in a favor to Warner Brothers. He asked them to make this yeah, movie. Yeah, make this movie. And the point of this movie is to tell the American people that the Soviet Union are not bad guys. That they're just like you and I. They're just like us, basically. They want freedom and liberalism yes. <laughs> and free speech. Yes, and Stalin's highest interests. Yeah, they're just, they're really great guys deep down inside. <laughs> I mean, this movie is full propaganda. I yeah. mean, it is. Yeah. So long story short is Joseph Davies gets asked by FDR and FDR never, he's just off screen. So you have this person who's like parroting. He, he's, F- he's like Dr. Claw from Inspector Gadget. <laughs> you see his hand every <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> he's, he's like uh, the president from Shin Godzilla. He's off screen. He's just a disembodied voice that's speaking, doing a, you know, FDR impression. Yeah. But you see the hand will hold a cigarette in a cigarette holder. So it must be FDR. <laughs> Exactly. But long story short is Joseph Davies goes to he goes to the Soviet Union to learn about, you know, and he's not there. He's there to just he's a plain talker. That's a yeah. big thing. He says a lot of I'm not a diplomat. I'm just a plain talker. Yeah. Yeah. Before he goes, there's a lot of people saying, oh, Russia, that place is bad and it's a terrible place and i hope you come back alive and it's like i'm gonna go there with both eyes open and i'm just gonna see the reality i'm not gonna let anyone pull the wool over my and eyes then drink the kool-aid by by the barrel <laughs> <laughs> which is highly <laughs> ironic because this guy <laughs> is the most gullible idiot we've ever seen in our lives well and, and also before he goes to the soviet union hmm. he takes a nice stopover in nazi germany he does yeah in hamburg he meets all these German people talking about who basically are hinting at they know that Germany wants to take over the world. And- There's an interlude where he goes and visits Helmar Schacht, uh, the Reich's minister for finance at the mm-hmm. time, I think. A fun fact, his real name was Horace Greeley Helmar Schacht. Huh. His parents lived in America for a time, and I guess they were big fans of the journalist Horace Greeley, the guy who ran against Grant in... Oh, yeah, in 1872. Yeah, and then died before... The Electoral College was <laughs> tallied. That huh. guy. Big fans of his. So yeah. they named their son hit that, uh, huh. which I think is interesting. I did not know that. But in it, he asks him, 
the, the United States is willing to disarm if Germany is willing to, to disarm as well. Yeah, but, but disarm down to something that only you, weapons that can be carried on a man's shoulder. Yeah. What? Which that's absurd, beyond absurd. Well, haven't you watched Starship Troopers? You can carry nuclear weapons on your shoulder. Oh, yeah, good point. Shit. Oh, no. <laughs> no airplanes, no no ships, no navy at all, I guess. Yeah. No. Well, we can have a navy, but no guns. People have to just shoot rifles at each other on deck. <laughs> so it's you fair. Give them a whiff of the old grape shot. <laughs> We'll go back to sailing boats. You can have like you can have muzzle loading cannons. That's it, you know. Um, so he stops in Nazi Germany. He meets shocked, but also before that, mm-hmm. when he's getting in the train to go to Berlin, oh, yeah, yeah, he's like walking through, and there's it, the the Hitler Youth apparently decide to have their daily march through the train station <laughs> on the platform. <laughs> They're just marching everywhere all the time. And that, oh, and there's lots, all lots of German officers have <laughs> monocles because yeah. that's how you know they're evil is all evil yeah. Germans have monocles. There's a guy that puts Hugo Spurl to, to shame <laughs> in terms of central casting for evil Nazi guy. <laughs> he looks ridiculous. Oh, and, oh and when they're on the train, there's this guy who walks into their compartment and starts talking to him. He's a German guy. He's like a stereotypical German guy. And he's dropping all these hints that Germany wants to conquer the world. He's talking about like, oh, we'll have great you, you, tobacco. Like, German tobacco is not very good. For now. For now. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but he talks exactly like Dr. Strangelove. He's like, high-pitched voice and all like that. <laughs> It's it's pretty comical. So ultimately, Joseph Davies and his wife and daughter mm-hmm. go to... Which, which apparently they were married the year or a couple months before they left. We looked it up. They got married in 35. Yeah. So I guess it's his daughter from his first marriage. Maybe. And yeah. his, this wife actually would ultimately divorce him like in the mid 50s, yeah. which is unusual for the time for extreme mental cruelty. We the, found, the yeah, artic- we we found an article online. Yeah. Yeah. And she would later sell a yacht to Trujillo, the dictator of the Dominican Republic. Public. Also, Joseph Davies, side note, <laughs> was awarded a coat of arms. Yes, he was. That later ended up being purchased by the, you won't believe this, the Trump Organization <laughs> that uses it still. His company bought Mar a Lago, I think. And then the crest was at Mar a Lago. Or it, something equivalent to that. And that's why the Trump Organization adopted it later. It's crazy. Can you believe the, the the connections that can get made? It's 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 nuts. Well, so Joseph Davies he goes to the Soviet Union and he meets Litvinov and Kalinin and what he learns is the Soviets are just interested in peace and they just want the Western allies to stand with them to stand up. Oh, by the way, the beginning of this movie too is Haile Selassie's speech. Yes, we forgot about that. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. There's the League of Nations. They mentioned that Italy has just invaded Abyssinia. And Haile Selassie is at the League of Nations, and he's giving a speech about how won't somebody stand up for these small nations against these great powers? I mean, gosh, if only there was a champion who would stop the big guys from stomping on the small guys. And then Litvinov just marches up and (laughs) (laughs) and talks about the same thing. Yeah, it comes to... It advocates for Ethiopia before the League of Nations, and, and the, the, the Germans walk out. The, the Italians Japanese. walk yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're disgusted with the whole thing. I like um, at one point a character talks about how the Axis powers want to divide the world in three, Asia, Europe, and Africa, Japan, Italy, and Germany. So I guess Italy is getting Africa. Just Africa, yeah. <laughs> um, also, I looked it up. The guy who plays Haile Selassie is named Lee Whipper. And he was born in South Carolina, born in the 1870s, and he lived to be 98 years old. This is extraordinarily long life for someone of that era. Yeah, yeah. I, I wondered who he was. I looked him up. Apparently, he was some kind of civil rights guy of importance. And there's a there's a painting of him that looks kind of cool. But yeah. So so Davies gets to the Soviet Union, and what he meets is the Soviet Union is just as it presents. It is a paradise. It is a worker's paradise where all work together, or maybe not all work together, Well, Max. yeah, we'll get to that. We'll get to second. that in just a minute. But on the train platform, when they get there, the first thing they do is, man, I'm so hungry. There's so much food everywhere. 
oh, we've got a samovar with tea and we've got caviar and we've got, oh, it's so wonderful. You know, just kind of uh, dispelling the whole famine. There could never be famine here. This place is amazing. No. It's so wonderful. Just a bunch of haters in the media. That's who. And he goes and tours around the Soviet Union and he goes to factories yeah. and he learns these these workers are just like American workers. They <laughs> even use American equipment. In fact, there's an American working in one factory who is a yes. supervisor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A foreign specialist. A foreign specialist. That was a big deal in the Soviet Union, foreign specialists. Guys like Trotsky hated the fact that they had to go to foreign countries to get experts to run their railroads, run their factories and stuff, because during the revolutions, a lot of the people who knew how to do stuff immigrated or joined the whites or that they just no longer were in positions. So they would hire foreigners to do stuff. So like Americans, Brits, Germans would go over there and work in these factories. There was a, a show trial in this town called Schatki, which means mine shaft. And it's like one of the first show trials. And it was against foreign specialists. Hmm. But yeah, this guy's from like, I think he says Texas. Texas, that's because it. Because yeah. he's missing a good hot dog. Yeah, I'd give a uh, 100 pounds of caviar for one good hot dog, he says. And he says, man, you know, we're working hard, but it just seems like sometimes things just go wrong around here. Like there'll be a gearbox that's misaligned or, you know, there's... Because I think it's sabotage. There's sab somebody's sabotaging us, but I don't know why. So they're like kind of planting a seed of, hmm. Yeah. And they talk about these giant factories that employ thousands of people and the workers, you know, after the government quota is met, the workers get to split the profit. So they're not right. that different from us. <laughs> yes, that's right. They kind of imply that, oh, capitalism exists here in the Soviet Union. I guess they're just like us. Yeah. And what it turns out is you meet Bukharin and yeah. Tukashevsky, yeah. Braddock. Yeah. Yeah. But too bad they're all foreign agents. Oh my God. Yeah. They're all chatting it up with Germans and Japanese and these, people. And the Italians yeah. too, even. <laughs> that petit bourgeois, out of touch capitalist Carl Raddick. <laughs> Look at him in his top hat and his tails. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so they all get a well, and then a factory gets blown up, and of course yeah. it's sabotage. It couldn't yeah. be poor worksmanship. No, that. impossible. Couldn't be that sabotage. And uh, do the hard, and also too, you see they they see military demonstrations of the Soviet Union, including mm. a parachute jump <laughs> that must be one of the most horrifying. <laughs> Where the people just get out, they just go over the wing. Yeah, <laughs> they just sit on the wing and then roll off the edge. It's Great crazy. Idea. <laughs> and the parachutes have no harnesses, so you're just hanging from a rope. You only see it very briefly, but there's a guy who hits the ground and he just like, he gets bent over backwards. It looks horrifying. Oh, God. <laughs> oh my well, God. So it turns out that, that these people are all saboteurs. You know, Bukharin, yeah. they're saboteurs, and they show the show trials. Yeah, because you know how you know they're saboteurs? Because they tell you. <laughs> yeah, they all get called up. Citizen Raddick, tell us what your plan was. Well, my plan was to help split the Soviet Union. I was working as an agent for this German government. But mm. actually, we were working through the mega agent of them all. God, I forget his name. Trotsky! <laughs> oh my God, Leon Trotsky, that fascist, <laughs> that, that fa fascist reactionary Leon Trotsky. Oh my God, <laughs> that rightist. After watching this movie, you want to be the one to go stick the, <laughs> stick the ice pick in his head. <laughs> I mean, and this is the core of when people talk about this movie. This is its most shameful moment. Are this showing the the show trials, and it goes on for like thirty minutes, probably. So one thing, yeah, it's a significant portion of the running time. And something interesting about this film is that they depict the Moscow trials as one single trial, and everybody's in the same room, and everyone's pointing fingers at each other. It's like, well, you know, I was contacted by Bukharin. Isn't that true, Bukharin? No, it's not true. Well, actually, it is. Sorry, I lied to you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm colluding with Japan and and Germany and all those people. But in reality, the Moscow trials happened over the course of two years. I think it was thirty six to thirty eight. We don't see anything from the first trial. The first trial was when Kamenev and Zinoviev were executed. They were already in prison. They were put in prison after the assassination of Sergei Kirov. Uh, what's that guy's name? Leonid Nikolaev, I think his name is. He shot Sergei Kirov, and then Stalin was like, well, a lone wolf assassin is impossible. There has to be a conspiracy, and I know who's behind it. It's Trotsky. So start rounding people up. And 
Kaminev and Zinoviev were, were scooped up in that, put in prison. But then the first Moscow trial, which was like, I think, a year later, a year or two later, they brought them out of prison to try them some more and then execute them. <laughs> they were both killed. And, and it, it's like funny in a way that it's just so ridiculous. And you have mm-hmm. Joseph, our old friend Joe Davies, who's watching it. And he says, you know, after his, uh, 20 years of experience as an attorney, these confessions seem legitimate to me. This seems <laughs> like a very fair trial. It's like, uh, you know, it, as a man who's watched a lot of Perry Mason, I think this makes a lot of sense. <laughs> it's people, like Perry Mason on steroids. <laughs> yeah, where people stand up and just start confessing to all their crimes in front of the jury <laughs> for no reason. <laughs> For absolutely no reason. And it hides a really horrible truth, as we were talking about before we started recording, is that mm-hmm. these people were all tortured yeah. into giving these yeah. confessions. And like you said, for Tukashevsky, like, I, I mean, mean, these people were subject to the most horrible treatment. So, I mean, the idea that they just decided, because their explanation is, I think Radek says, or Bukharin, I, one of them says, like, I was thinking about it and my traitorous ways were just so horrible that I, this is the only way to repent is to give myself up to you to be executed. Yeah, that's Bukharin, yeah. And Tukhachevsky, you mentioned him. In real life, he was tried in camera. It was not public. It was not on the radio. But the first, second, and third Moscow trials were like banan- media bonanzas. But in this movie, Tukhachevsky is in the room talking about how, yes, I was going to be the military dictator after we removed Stalin. We got rid of him, and then I would become the Napoleon Bonaparte of the Soviet Bonapartism. Union. Bonapartism. Yeah, Bonapartist, Yeah. Uh, or Trotsky. Maybe he would be the dictator. I don't know. Who knows? Um, Maybe he liked Mexico City a lot, so, you know. (laughs) Maybe he's going to stay there forever. (laughs) Oh, and something I kind of want to go on a little bit of a rant about is that during Tukhachevsky's testimony, he harps on the phrase, remove Stalin. Our plan was to remove Stalin. That is a reference to a document called Lenin's Testament. To explain, in the 1920s, in the latter years and months of Lenin's life, he suffered from multiple strokes that left him debilitated. He was confined to his bed, but he was still able to communicate to the rest of the government via his wife, Nadezhda Krupskaya. She would take dictation, and he would express opinions about various things the government was doing. And one of his final uh, missives that was sent out was this thing called Lenin's testament later on people would call it that and basically it's a long disjointed rant about how various members of the government are just not up to snuff as far as he was concerned he insults bukharin he insults trotsky but most importantly he insults stalin he says stalin isn't good with working with other people he calls him a rude person in it and he says he's not a good fit for the general secretary position we should remove stalin from that position and then lenin would end up dying not too long after that and so after this people who didn't like stalin one of the chief arguments they would make they would say well lenin didn't want stalin to be in charge he didn't want him to be general secretary and they would circulate copies of lenin's testament And eventually it became a calling card of being a member of the opposition, according to the government. If you had a copy of Lenin's Testament, you were toast. It was clear evidence that you were a terrorist. Though in the original meaning, Lenin was just saying, I don't think Stalin's a good fit for this. He should work someplace else. But the way the movie portrays it, oh, clearly they want to murder Stalin. There's no other way to remove Stalin than by killing him. So he's a terrorist. So I just wanted to get into that because it's kind of a a niche bit of Soviet history that's going to fly over most people's heads. Oh, God. Um, but it, but it, it just is crazy. I mean, it's yeah. just, it's laughable in one way, but also horrible that this is propaganda being... Yeah. And, and I mean, and I think that gets to the heart of the matter for this movie is, is that obviously this was meant to help Americans feel more akin to the Soviets during the war. They are allies. So there's there are rational reasons for why this movie was made. But how much of a disservice is it doing? Yeah. In hindsight, it is unbelievably embarrassing, this film. (laughs) Yeah. They meet Stalin. He meets Stalin, too, towards the end of it. And he's this kindly figure 
I mean, it's all, it's just pure propaganda about how if you don't get England and Russia, the United States to align with me, I may ma- may have to make a deal to protect my country because I can't stand alone against the Soviets. I can only stand together. I mean, it's just, it's like. And, and it's definitely written in hindsight. Oh the, my God, the, all yeah. this, Davies knows everything in the future. He's like, we need to do this. We need to support the Soviet Union or he's going to sign a pact with Hitler. Oh, we have to do this. Like later, they talk about Finland, how the Soviet Union attacked Finland. And it was like, well, the Soviet Union knew that Germany was going to invade, so they had to secure well, their he, territory. He justifies the, the Winter War. Yeah. yeah. He's, is it, what was he said? That the Soviets knew that the Germans were going to attack, so they had to ask the, the Finns to give them some areas where they could put troops to protect themselves, but the Finns wouldn't do it, so the Soviets had to move in of their own accord to protect their own interests. I mean, that is, if that's apologi- apologetics for the Soviet, I mean, what else is there? And I mean, he's technically true that Stalin did offer a territory transfer. But Finland's a sovereign nation. They can say no to this, you know, yeah. just because you you ask so someone to go on a date with you doesn't mean that if they say no, you're entitled to then shoot them or something like, yeah, the apologetics for the Soviet Union is is out of control. It's crazy. Yeah. And that's the real shame of this movie. I mean, yeah. it's what makes it fun. I mean, it is. I mean, we were laughing. I mean, it yeah. feels horrible to laugh, but I mean, it's so over the top and it's so i mean they you, they just don't make movies like this anymore certainly well, not good. in the united states <laughs> well it is good but i'm just saying yeah. this is that that's why we like these movies you know and we're we're planning to continue to try and review other crazy propaganda movies from World War II, there's some non-World War II movies I can think of that perhaps may, f- but like they don't, I mean, it's just, it's such an artifact of its era and it makes sense in 1943 when the war is not clear how the war is going to end, yeah. that they would make a movie like this, but holy crap, were they overselling the Soviet Union? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I guess that's the counter argument is that, well, it's our allies and well, we need to popularize them with the public because obviously that's a sticking point with a lot of people. A lot of people don't like the Soviet Union for killing the czar, for being an anti religious religious nation for the wars of aggression that they fought in the past it's it's a little bit of a tough sell and (laughs) i think this movie was a mistake but i can sort of understand where it's coming from to sell it to the american public but once again i i still i still don't think it was a good idea Well, because there's at the very core of it there's a truth which is the soviets are absolutely vital to the allied war effort yeah you know what is it andrew roberts says it's britain provides the time america provides the materiel and uh, Russia provides the blood, or yeah. was it Antony Bivor? One of the two. Bivor. It's, one of those. <laughs> it's it's him or Roberts, Andrew. But it but it's that's the. I mean, the Russians are an absolutely critical. It's the back of the Wehrmacht is broken on the Eastern Front. Yeah, we have to keep Russia in as an ally. But you know, <laughs> a bit, so you can see why they did it. But it is a mistake in hindsight. Yeah. I mean, it just there had to have been a better way to sell sell it. But I guess subtlety goes out the window in wartime yeah, yeah. propaganda. And, and I mean, you can also make the argument that the whole reason that the Soviets were in the geopolitical situation that they were, that they were attacked by the Germans, was of their own making. Like you could make that argument, but yes, yeah. Well, the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact get is just so they talk glossed about, over, so glossed over until yeah. the very end, where someone there's these shouting, crazy eyed people at like events <laughs> are getting up and shouting at Joe Davies, and he's like, they had to do the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact because we abandoned them, yeah, and they had to yeah. protect themselves because they weren't ready to fight. Although he talks about the Soviet army is the most advanced and powerful army in the world, and. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it just doesn't... Look at, look at 1941 and maybe, hmm. <laughs> they became a lot more advanced later, but they had a lot of trouble at the very beginning. The T-35 tank, the most yeah. advanced tank. The more turrets, the better. <laughs> Which, by the way, they also feature a military parade and they show off the beautiful cavalry. Oh, the cavalry, it's so great. Which is ironic because earlier in the movie, they just killed Tukhachevsky. And like Tukhachevsky was a huge advocate of tanks and deep battle and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's like, nope, we're going to wind back the clocks to Great War era shit. Yeah. Like, uh, you kind of cringe when you see that. Yeah. I mean, it is very much a movie of its time, but holy, it just, holy crap. It just, that these Stalinist purges, I mean, they make it out like this was true. All of it. Stalin was right. His paranoia was all completely correct. (laughs) Everyone was really plotting against him. It was all sabotage and he was just acting in self-defense. I mean, poor little defenseless. Uh, I don't want to call it Russia because it's not Russia. It's the Soviet Union. It's mm-hmm. a lot more than just Russia. Yeah. 
the most absurd moment in this movie and I, I think it's 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 a little understated but it's the fact early on in the movie where they're freaking out about the fact that there might be bugs in the embassy and davies <laughs> is like let them bug it who cares? I'm a straight shooter. I'm going to be honest. I wouldn't say anything about the Soviet Union in these doors that I wouldn't say straight to Stalin's face. And it's like, wow, what a moron. What an idiot. <laughs> what? Yeah, what a, what an idiot. My God. <laughs> and then later on, he's talking to Kalinin and Mikhail Kalinin, who's like the president of the so He's like the figurehead of the Soviet Union, yeah. ostensibly the leader. But of course, it's actually Stalin. And Kalinin is like, you are such a stand up and honorable man. You say the best things about us behind closed doors to our enemies and the worst things about us right to our faces. And it's like, how do you know what he says behind closed doors? Could it be because you're bugging him all the time? Well, and even his assistant is like, well, another embassy, the British embassy found wires in their rafters that weren't there. And he's yeah. like, oh, pff, oh, that's poppycock. You Come know, on, what? please. You know. Imagine this guy being a lawyer in court. <laughs> half expecting to say like for all my clients who ended up being executed you know <laughs> just like the worst lawyer ever <laughs> he's like this my, bumbling my 20 years of law experience yeah at the beginning of the movie he's in a rowboat rowing around and it's like begging him please please i want you to bring this case in front of the they supreme say, court come try this case in front of the supreme court cases are argued in front of the supreme court the supreme court is not a trial court yeah get it right idiots Damn it. Well, they didn't get anything else right in this movie, so why would they get that one right either? Oh, also I forgot, the Japanese uh, characters all wear Tojo glasses. That's I'm true. looking at the notes. As we were watching, I was like furiously scribbling down notes. Just everything the Soviets say is true. Just mm. everything the Soviets say is true. Yeah. Stalin couldn't lie if he tried. They say he's so honest. They're all so very honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This was written by Howard Koch. I think mm -hmm. you pronounce that K-O-C-H. One of the Koch brothers, just one kidding. Of the he is the writer of Casablanca. Well, one of the three writers. Yes. And, and it was also directed by the director of Casablanca as yes. well. Not as fondly remembered as a World War II movie. No, considering how... Oh, also, too, looking through the notes before we forget. Yes, uh, the guy who plays Genrik Yagata looks like Saddam Hussein, and the guy who plays Marshal Timoshenko looks like Joe Rogan. <laughs> he does. He really does. <laughs> yeah, Yagoda did not look like that. I think he's he was bald by this point. Yes, I'm not he sure. looks a little bit like Hitler if you look at pictures of him walking around. <laughs> yeah, he does have that toothbrush mustache. And they don't show uh, Yezhov either. Yeah, Yezhov not. So they, there's a lot of things they don't show in this movie. They don't show Yezhov. They don't show the officer purges. They don't show... Oh, my God. I just remember this. I can't remember if this is true. I, I'm not sure if this is true. I read this on a website. I wish it's true. But in the original version of this film, there was a scene where Trotsky met with Hitler. And like... <laughs> Hitler was dictating how he needs to dismantle the USSR. That might not be true, but oh I God, really I hope it is true. That, that would be <laughs> beyond hysterical. I wish that was in the movie. Yeah, because Trotsky was like one of the first notable people on the left to attack Hitler. Yeah. Like yeah. he was the one calling out Stalin. That's one of the great lines from our Spanish Civil War episode. Stalin, you coward, you Termidorian, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, but Yezhov's not in it. He's Yezhov was tiny. He made Stalin yeah, look giant, which is guy. funny because Stalin was not tall at He's all. He's like five foot zero. He's very small. Yezhov, yeah. Yeah, Yezhov, Yezhov. They called him the little blackberry and also <laughs> the yellow dwarf. Uh, and he's the great villain of all this. So that's kind of the crazy thing is that by 1943, Yuzhov was also purged. Yuzhov was the head. So this is how schizophrenic this whole thing is. In the first trial, Yagoda is the head of the security services, like the OGPU or the NKVD. I can't remember which one it is at that point. But then by the second trial, he's been purged. And now Yagoda, the former head of the security services, is now on trial for his life and he gets executed. And Yuzhov is now in charge. And then there's the third trial. And then after that, Yuzhov gets purged and replaced with Beria, which really calls into question all the people that Yuzhov arrested in the second and third trials. It makes you think, wait a second, were those guys actually guilty or were they innocent? That's a question a lot of people had on their minds. And even to this day, people who are like Stalin apologists have trouble keeping keeping it straight. Like who was actually guilty and who wasn't guilty? <laughs> Everyone agrees Yuzhov was bad. Everybody agrees that. But like, was Yagoda also bad or was he innocent? I, I don't know. Oh, no. <laughs> 
that naive babe in the woods Stalin. He was just he was led astray by yeah, I know. No one more naive, no more trusting. Not a cynical bone in his body. No, he's just not one, <laughs> not he's one cynical a, bone. A, a wide eyed idealist. That's that's what he is. It's crazy. Oh, we forgot. So after Davies leaves, because he stops being ambassador in like November of nineteen thirty eight, mm-hmm. he travels back to the United States, but he makes a stopover in Britain. That's right. To see Winston Churchill. <laughs> Winston Churchill, yeah. <laughs> Wow, he wearing his famous pork pie hat as he builds a brick wall in a garden for some reason. That that almost seems like it might be real, like a reference to something. But I've never heard of Winston Churchill making brick walls in his backyard. That yeah. was bizarre. Well, <laughs> I, either way, as he talks to him and Churchill's like, yes, I agree. Russia's our ally. Yes, of course. He yes. completely wins over Churchill. I'm going to help you rally support for the USSR so we can <laughs> fight against the Germans. <laughs> hysterical yeah and the guy actually kind of looks a little bit like churchill he he does yeah yeah. you know it just is crazy that it's just hard to imagine something like this being made yeah yeah it is hard to believe i mean like you joked about in the gabriel over the white house episode it makes sense why post-war people had some questions about the making of this movie and like the communist sympathy that was exhibited in the making of this film like i i I can kind of understand why they had some concerns about that and why wouldn't they i mean this looks like it looks like the soviet union made this movie yeah but you know a lot of people were won over by this sort of propaganda and they really liked the soviet union and they dismissed pretty much all the i mean as it is in this film all the criticism of the soviet union is either by fascists or crazy people and they were just like well i guess fascists or crazy people are saying bad things about the soviet union well, they would it, say, like, all this information about them is just fake. It's not real. And this wasn't the only propaganda movie put out there. There was That's true. There's The Boy from Stalingrad, The <laughs> North Star, which is a movie I have seen, which I think we should review for this because that movie is wild. Yeah. But the U.S. government understood that there were a lot of people still hesitant to support the Soviet Union, so they, they needed to build up support. And while well, it's you do it but through this. Through propaganda, through yeah, making films. Through this propaganda, yeah. Through no, art. Um, it is funny, too. There's a scene where they talk about Pearl Harbor at the very yeah. end, and it shows uh, these two-engine Japanese bombers attacking Pearl Harbor, which I don't remember that part of Pearl Harbor, <laughs> but okay. Okay. <laughs> what the hell's going on here? Yeah. <laughs> very strange. That There's a minor character in this movie named, I think it's Lieutenant Kamenev. Interesting choice of a name, considering one of the guys purged yes. is Kamenev. But this guy... The actor was in the film Mrs. Miniver. He's the Luftwaffe pilot who takes the eponymous Mrs. Miniver uh, captive near the end of the movie. Um, Interesting. But good movie. Big fan of Mrs. Miniver. I recommend it. I've never seen it. I'll have to see it. It's an early depiction of the Dunkirk extraction. Like one Ah. of the characters. It's very similar to Downton Abbey. Have you ever seen that? Yes, I have. It's like the prototype for Downton Abbey. Ah. There's a flower contest in that movie, and then there's a flower contest in the first episode of Downton Abbey. It's like bookending one another. Huh. It's like kind of continuing the story, sort of. It's it's well, not really, because the time period's all different. But I mean, it's like continu- It's a spiritual successor to Mrs. Miniver. <laughs> This this movie's just wild, and There's, I highly recommend that you watch it. I mean, it is. It's almost hard to watch at times. Like yeah. it's just makes so you cringe a little bit. Yeah, cringe, but also laugh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They go to uh, the Kharkiv tractor factory mm-hmm. uh, at one point. They do. Yeah. Yeah. Magnitogorsk. Yeah, they go to Magnitogorsk. Yeah, Magnitogorsk, yeah. yeah. They talk about this steel plant is gigantic, and it's made on the model of the same one we have in Gary. And he's talking about Gary, Indiana. To explain that a little bit, Gary, Indiana was once the most industrialized city on the planet, and Magnitogorsk was built by the Soviets as a copy of Gary, Indiana, to make their own Gary, Indiana. Also, at one point, they refer to secret police guys, and they call them Gapios, and we're like, what the hell are they talking about? And I eventually I realized it's GPU, mm-hmm. the GPU guys. But gay PUs, they're using like the Russian pronunciation of the letters, which is interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Gives people the wrong idea. Wild film. Yeah. It boggles your mind that something like this got made. It really does. And man, they they really don't like Japanese people in the movie. They, they really do don't like them at all. There's even a scene where he goes to see injured Chinese people who've fled from China all the way to Moscow. 
Yeah. From I don't know why. From, why they're in Moscow, who knows? From from the tyranny of the Japanese. Yeah. I guess because they were like, there's just not enough anti-Japanese sentiment in this movie. You need to work it in. <laughs> people are falling asleep. <laughs> Give the people what they want. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Oh, uh, this movie uses interludes from the song "O Field, My Field" or "Polushka Polie," which is an excellent Russian folk song. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's Cossack dancing at one point. There Classic. is. Yeah, it looks it looks crazy. Yeah. It looks really hard on the knees. To be yes, honest with you, it does. Uh, I wish there was more Stalin in this film. I'll say that. Yeah, he only shows up for about five or seven minutes towards the end. Yeah. Played by Manart Kippen. Manart Kippen, eh? He's got no Wikipedia page, so I guess we don't know who he is. (laughs) Wish we knew you, Manart. Yeah, I wish I I knew you too. One more thing to throw in there. We were looking at the list of people who were killed in the first Moscow trial, and there's a man named, it looks like Richard Pickle. I think it's Richard Pickel. Mm-hmm. But Richard Pickle, you could even say Pickle Rick. You could say you could say that, yeah, or Dick Pickle. You can Dick call it Pickle, that too. Dick yeah. Pickle. Uh, <laughs> I thought that was mildly amusing. Um, uh, no, this is this is really. I'm, I'm glad we watched it. It was yeah. wild, yeah. but really interesting to watch. And I'll say that having read Stephen Kotkin's Stalin biography the parts where they talk about like all the stuff that's in this movie. Like if you didn't know anything at all about history, you might think this is a little odd how it's characterizing Joseph Stalin as a good guy. And you know, some of this stuff just seems slightly off, but the more you actually know the reality of what's going on, the more insane it becomes. It just gets more and more crazy. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) 100%. I mean, this is, this is pure lunacy. Yeah. But you should watch it because it is yeah, it's, highly recommended. Yeah, highly recommend it. Yeah. yeah, we'll have to find some other good propaganda films to review. Yeah, hmm. North Star is definitely up there. There's that Fall of Berlin movie. Oh. We need to figure that out. Oh yeah, that's right. You sent me some stuff you'd found on that. Yeah, Kiss Me, Stalin. Kiss Me, <laughs> Kiss Me, Stalin. Just working in the garden and just <laughs> loved by all the people. And there's a version on YouTube, but unfortunately the subtitles are atrocious. They're like five or 10 seconds off. Sometimes uh, it, uh, I'll, I'll find, find a solution. It. I'll find a solution. We should also probably do the movie, uh, the green berets. I've heard, I've heard from, about this. About from the Vietnam era. It's like pure propaganda too. Uh, uh, um, North star. North, North Star? Star yeah. yeah, I want to... Yeah, because it's all about, like, communal farms yeah, and stuff. Life yeah, life on a communal farm in Ukraine in 1941. Amazing. Oh, boy. Yeah. yeah. It sounds no, great. No Holodomor here. <laughs> no. This is... I mean... And then those nasty-ass Germans invade. <laughs> we'll, we'll be on the lookout. At, yeah. Hey, if anybody knows of any crazy films that are even crazier, if you actually know the history behind them, let us know. Like, comment and uh, give us a suggestion. Yeah, we'd because, be happy to try and watch some more. Yeah, because these sorts of videos are a lot of fun. Yeah. You know? Well, good. Well, thank you all for tuning in. And we'll, we're will we going to keep working on trying to find more of these movies so we can keep these reviews up. Yeah, this is a lot of fun. I'm really excited. I am, too. Mm. This is Matt signing off. And this is Max signing off. Have a good day, guys. That is why I am deeply grateful. To those fine patriotic citizens, the Warner Brothers. Don't you gay pay you as ever get any sleep? If you want my advice, boys, I wouldn't jump at any wild conclusions till you know the facts. Wait for the trial. Yes, sir. What's your opinion, Mr. Davis? Based on 20 years of trial practice, I'd be inclined to believe these confessions. Have you gentlemen anything to say concerning the Russian purge? Japan abhors the brutality of the Russian administration. Thank you very much.